let's just go on now with languages and dialects here we go we looked at this last week and we saw that there's no big distinction between the two countries as you move from one country to another country the dialect doesn't really, really change and um, uh, I was pointing out that if we look at the state of affairs in Europe um, perhaps a rather old map here but still it's, it's, it's a worthwhile, worthwhile looking at you'll see that this is the West Romance dialect continuum and it spreads all the way down here and the point that I was making last week is that a hundred years ago, 150 years ago, 200 years ago if you went from Rome all the way down from Paris all the way down to Rome as you moved across the border there would be no change of dialect there is still on the border between, between uh, southern France and, 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 and Italy they speak very much the same dialect both ways, both sides but there is maybe no difference of, of uh, dialect, dialect but you can hear it you can yeah, I think you can hear it. You can hear the change, but I don't think people living absolutely on the border. No, I mean when you when you travel, if you go from Paris to Rome. Yeah, you, you see, we we travel so fast today, don't we? We travel in a train or a car. We travel another five hundred uh, uh, kilometers, and we sta step out and we talk to somebody else, and we go on. You know, we don't. We're not going gradually from place to place. And today there is this big change that I talked about last week that the people living here look to Paris and they move their language in the direction of Paris and the people living here look to Rome and they move their language in the direction of Rome but uh, the point I'm trying to make is that this is a fairly new development in the history of Europe and before that you did have this, this, this variation, this gentle variation and, and as we'll see in a minute You could, sorry? You could understand someone, you could talk with someone from Rome if you were from Paris? No, 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 no. You couldn't talk, if you lived in Paris, you couldn't talk to somebody here. And these people couldn't talk to anybody here. And these people couldn't talk to anybody here. I mean, in the Middle Ages they would use Latin to talk together. Okay. But if you went just village from village is not much change all the way through that's what I'm trying to say it's the same type of language all the way through okay when you cross from one continuum into another if you're a French type speaker and you live across the border here you'll find a different thing because the other side are people are speaking an entirely different language and then you get an area of transition where people speak two languages that's a little bit different. I want to try and make this a little bit clearer, clearer and it should be clearer if you read, if you read Gunnar and uh, Melchior and, and Shaw. We got here. Um, if we look at it this way, if you look at any country, and we'll take Britain now, okay? We'll take England now. You can have, you can draw a map, you can draw a graph with the social axis here. That's to say that the people who have uh, the most money, the most political power, the most education at the top, and the people who have the least control of their lives, they're at the bottom. Okay? Uh, it's a very crude social scale, and it happens, of course, everywhere. It happens here in Iceland, although we don't like to, we'd like to pretend we're all of the same class, but of course we're not all the same class, not money-wise, and not education-wise, and not um, control-wise. So what we can say is that if this is England, you've got, uh, you've got the top of the social class here and the bottom of the social class here, but if you go across the geographical axis, here, for instance, you could say is Taunton in the southwest of England. Here is Dublin, uh, Dundee or, or, or Aberdeen in the east of Scotland. As you go through the geographical area, you'll find a lot of differences in dialect. People living in uh, Aberdeen uh, 
ordinary people on the street living in Aberdeen, they can't understand people in Taunton, in the southwest of England, and vice versa. They speak such a different type of English. Okay? But, the, but in everywhere along this social axis, you get, along this geographical axis, you get social classes. And as you go up the social class, there are fewer and fewer speakers until you get the top of the social class. And then you get pretty well entirely and only RP speakers, wherever you are. Okay? So everywhere along here, this geographical axis, you will find people who speak <coughs> RP. They're there everywhere in Britain. Absolutely everywhere. Uh, but there are a few of them. As you come down, you'll find people here, for instance, a larger, much larger group of people who are speaking uh, standard English with the regional with the regional accent. They sound like people from that area, but they're speaking standard English and they're educated. And as you come on further down, you get people who can't move up towards a more RP type language. On this social scale, we can say that people are quite movable. People at the bottom can move their dialect up to about here, so they sound more educated. People here can go backwards and forwards. RP people can go down a little bit and sound more demotic, more sort of... Uh, but, but in general, you've got this sort of feeling. You've got the regional dialects, and they all look towards the center, RP, as being the standard. Okay. Although, as I said originally, RP was just a, another regional dialect, just like all the others. It just took up the position of being the standard dialect, the, sta the dialect of government, the dialect of control. Okay. If you can keep this picture in your mind, because we're going, I'm going on to use it in different ways now. In this way, for instance. Let's look at the situation in, on the continent, in the Germanic area on the continent. Um, well, we can even say today it still exists. On the ground, uh, shall we say, um, um, geographically, you've got many types of German being spoken in the streets and in the farms and so on. And there's not much of a change as you move into Holland. This is sort of Plattdeutsch or Low German. As you move into Holland, it's not much of a, of a change. Of course, people speaking here will speak very differently from people here. But in Holland, they look at the standard language, Dutch, which was originally a regional language, which is now the educated language of the whole of, whole of Holland. And in Germany, they look at the standard language, Hochdeutsch, which is now, um, which was once a, a, a very, very regional language, but now is spoken pretty well by everybody. The same situation that we were talking about before, the same situation that was in Vestre and Estre Niskoga. But, let's go on a little bit. That's the same situation as this. But let's go on a little bit and look at this very interesting area here in the south of Sweden, Skåne, okay, it was formerly under the Danish king. And Denmark uh, was this sort of size, okay, and it still goes out to Bornholm here. So that people living in Skåne looked to Copenhagen as their standard. All right? And we can show... And then the change occurred. When was it? 16-something or other? When was it that... that, that uh, 1658. It does say 1658. Oh, good. That's right. Good. So I know that date, don't I? 1658. Sweden uh, took over Skorna, and people living in this area started looking to the, the, the court in Sweden as being their centre. So this is what we can see happened we can see that here is the old frontier with Sweden here here is Skåne, here's Skåne, the south of Sweden 
and these are the Danish dialects. And in the old days, they looked towards Denmark, and now they look towards Sweden. Okay, but it doesn't. It has, of course, an eff- a big effect on the way people speak. In Skåne, the language has become much more Swedish-like than it was 400 years ago. Then it was much more Danish-like. It was just like another dialect of Danish, because Danish had lots of dialects then, and now it's like another dialect of Swedish, lots of dialects then. So you can see, and when we look in, in, in chapter, this chapter here, first chap- two chapters here in Merkis and Shaw, you can see how we, how, how we must look at these things. We must look at them as, as changing, shifting allegiances. Language itself is a political concept which changes. Really, there's nothing but different dialects and different accents. Okay. And you think of that again, what I said last, last, last Monday, if we can keep this in our minds from Monday. Think of the difference between Sweden and Denmark and Iceland and, and the Scandinavian languages. We'll keep Iceland out of it. We'll keep Iceland and the Faroes out of it. The Scandinavian languages on the continent, think of the difference between these uh, at least three Scandinavian languages, Norse languages, Danish, the two types of Norwegian, Swedish, four Okay, think of the difference between these different languages which are called different languages and on the other hand the difference between all the languages in, in China which are much more diverse than the languages in, 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 in Scandinavia much more diverse but they call themselves one language Chinese is one language you can go on like this a long time. You've got to see that language is first and foremost a, a, a politico-linguistic, a social-linguistic, a politico-linguistic concept. And it follows that if you look at medieval manuscripts, if you look at the situation in uh, before, shall we say, the Renaissance in, in, in Europe and in Iceland, the name, the term language, as they used it then, lingua, idioma, tunga, whatever you like to say, the term for language did not mean the same as it does today. It meant something quite different. It meant a group of dialects of which nothing, none of them was higher than the others. Today it means a group of dialects of which one is higher than the others and better than the others. So it's a big change, okay? Uh, I want to I want to just look at the next one and see if we can explain why these things happen. Why do we have different types of pronunciation in the world in in, 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 in one language area and it's a question of whether we look at it as trees or waves why are there different accents and dialects why is brother pronounced brother in the south of England and brother in the north why is this change okay now we can look at this change in many different ways and the, the traditional way of doing it is by thinking in terms of tree diagrams. You know this diagram, don't you? You've probably been looking at it at the moment in the history of English if you're in the first year. Or you've done it in the history of English, Proto-Indo-European, which splits out into all these different groups, into Tocharian Indo-European and so on, and Germanic, which splits out into all these different groups, and at the end, you've got the end of the tree, you've got these different, different languages, and then we can go on splitting them out into different dialects of the language. That is the traditional way of looking at it. They, as language, as language um, develops, it, it spreads out. It, it, it diverges into different points. That's the traditional way of looking at it, and there's a lot of common sense in looking at it this way. 
This is the Germanic group then, um, which I suppose you have to learn in the history of the English language and have learnt in the history of the English language. The idea that Germanic was one language split into North and West and East, then it split into all these, and now we've got Icelandic and Faroese and Norwegian and Swedish and Danish and English and so on. Okay, that is the the tree diagram, if you like. And as I say, yes, that is what happened to a certain extent. Let's look at this single group here, Old English to Middle English to English. Okay, and we can say, for instance, that here's Old English, and it keeps splitting into different types of dialects. That's not really at all true, because Old English itself was a mass of dialects. And Middle English was a mass of dialects. And Modern English is quite a large amount of dialects. So things were coming together as well. But we can look at it in this way historically. And if we want to go back to brother and brother, we can do it this way. Let's say that as language changes, here is a change which occurs in one linguistic variable. Perhaps R drops out. Perhaps U changes to A. Something like that. Any change you like. One linguistic variable. Then we split, and in this group, this change occurs, and in that group, this change occurs, so that when we get down to the bottom, we have these two different dialects, one looking like this, and the other looking like this. Okay? That's the sort of thing that happening. Different changes are happening. This change doesn't happen there. This change doesn't happen there. But this change happens in both of these dialects. Okay. So that we could say, for instance, supposing we've got the form, the Middle English form, brother, brother. Okay. And we go, we split it into two here. On this side, this rule occurs, which, if you remember from phonetics, is the dropping of the R rule. I'll look at that a bit in a minute. And that gives us brother without the R on the end. On this side, it doesn't occur. So brother is the same here. So we would say what happened was then that, um, that uh, the language split and a change happened here which didn't happen here. And that really is what's happening when we get splits. Every time we get a split, every time we get something happening differently in the south and the north, we can say the change happened in the north but not in the south, or the change happened in the south but not in the north. That's the sort of thing that's happening. Uh, just look at that to remind ourselves what this horrible little box here means. It means, doesn't it, uh, R becomes, you remember, zero, and this is the slash which tells us, which splits the, the formula into two. You should remember this from, 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 from phonetics. This is what happens, and this is where it happens. R becomes zero. Where does it happen? It happens here in front of a consonant or the end of a word. All right? That's the, as we look at it, we'll see that this means, this is what happens. R becomes zero, that's to say R disappears. Then the slash says, it happens when, and these are the conditions when it happens, when it occurs in front of a consonant or at the end of a word. And remember then that this line here, always this line here, always refers back to this change. This is the change and this line shows the position of the process. It happens here in front of either of these two and we've got wavy brackets here which means either of these two in front of a consonant or the end of a word. So we can, this is just a quick way of writing the change which is R disappears when it's followed by a consonant or comes at the end of the word. You remember that, of course, don't you, from phonetics? Okay, everybody's saying, yeah, I remember that, yeah, yeah, good, splendid. Um, we won't be using a lot of these horrible formulae, and I'll explain them all, and I think it should be coming fairly clear. But this 
this formulation here is one that you have to remember occurs in some of the branches of English but not of the others okay it occurs in English as it's spoken in most of England but not really so much in Scot not at all in Scotland and not in the southwest and so on we look at that so there we go again here's your change from brother and brother but now we get into problems with trees because if we wanted to show the change between between brother and brother then it happens on this side but it also happens on this side so that you get brother brother and in some places you get brother so it's a twist what that's that's um I'm not happy about this slide. I think I'll not let you look at it anymore because it's a little bit wrong in some respects. Let's go on to the next one. It's a twist here. You remember this from last week. So you can get an isogloss here which distinguishes plus A from minus A. Here is minus A and here is plus A. We can say here, for instance, is, non, is roticism still. Here is non-roticism. And this, this one here gives us the, the, the distinction between plus B and minus B. This is, if you like, brother, and that is brother. And we get these four areas out of it. So you see that just working in... Mm, the A plus A is the uh, disappearance of the A. Sorry, no, here... Here is here is you see this is the this is this is a change which we'll call A. Here's a change which we'll call B. So in this area you've got plus A and plus B. Minus A but plus B. Minus A and minus B plus B but plus A but minus B. Yeah, but if we're talking about roticism and non roticism. If we're talking about roticism? Yeah. And then, then plus A could be the disappearance yeah, what we would say, if, if, if our process is called is R dropping, R dropping, then it has been dropped here, has been dropped here, plus. Hasn't been dropped here, hasn't been dropped here. And B would then be strut, foot, split, difference between brother and, 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 and butcher, okay. If that has not happened here, here it's not happened, there it has happened. Um, this is just this is just hypothetic, but this is just shows that that two changes can produce four areas. Three changes can produce how many areas? Wow! Seven changes can produce how many areas? Wow! I can't work that out. It's very very it's mathematically very very many indeed. And we looked at that. This is the reality. That's the reality of of what you're talking about just now, Camille. Here you've got you've got R and R, here's the R line, here people say brother and here they say brother and here you've got the, here you've got the ah, uh, line, here they say uh, brother and brother and here they say <coughs> brother, brother and brother okay so that's just that one word that's just the situation with that one word here we go, yes. Ah, that's on the web. You can look at this and work it out as you go through. And actually, as I said, uh, uh, this line here, the brother line, uh, the brother line on this first map here, which looks like this, with, with uh, no R's here, but R's here, this line has moved in this direction over the last 150 years and it now looks like it, it now looks like this it's moved very very much towards the east and it's moving further and further down here so more and more of these people are, are losing their R's and it's getting smaller and smaller it's a, it's a non-prestige this change is a prestige change, it's a cool change Remember, cool equals prestige. It's a cool change, and people are taking it up more and more and more. So, uh, and 
the point I want to make, I think, here is that if you look at the whole of the picture of the British Isles, you can think of tree diagrams and, and, and things splitting into various, various places. And we will be doing that quite a bit. But it's also very intelligent to think of every now and then as people are talking and we go this is in the middle ages okay as people are talking a new thing happens somewhere in the language here perhaps you get R dropping and nowhere else here perhaps you get uh, R turning into R and nowhere else here perhaps you get goose and foot falling together and nowhere else and what happens is that when things happen all over the place they sometimes catch on and sometimes don't catch on okay and they're much more likely to catch on in an area of influence so new things happening in London are much more likely to spread out over the whole country than new things happening here in Taunton where not many people hear them we can say if you like that these these things will automatically spread out in a wave pattern like dropping a stone into a, into a pool and you can see the, the waves dropping out and we'll come back to waves later because this is what has happened to so many things in English that, that something has started somewhere and spread out here things which start here will not catch on and that won't spread out other things will have higher prestige be cooler and be taken over by these people more. So that's another way of looking at changes in a dialect continuum <coughs> that, uh, that things occur in one place and spread out over the surrounding countryside and we can see this happening we can see this happening in very very many things which we might look at a little bit later I wonder if it's here Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> when was it that people in Paris stopped saying Paris and started saying Paris? When was it? When did the wh when did the r change to r? I don't know. But the story is that it happened because Louis the Fourteenth couldn't pronounce r, so he said r all the time, and so everybody took it. I don't. That's probably that's 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 probably not the true story. But for some reason, in Paris, in the sometime, uh, shall we say, the fifteenth or sixteenth century, it became common instead of saying r to say r. The guttural, the, the back R that we know from French, French today, that began in Paris. Did you have a question? Yeah, this is also in German. Right? Ah, 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 hang on, hold your horses, hold your horses, hold your horses, hold, yes, 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 you're right, okay. What happened? We know that, we know that uh, linguistically, it started in Paris then it started in Rouen then it started in other towns and from the towns it spread out into the countryside and before long it had jumped from Paris to Antwerp but they don't do it in Antwerp anymore do they maybe it jumped straight to Copenhagen What happens is that it, it's a, um, it's a, it's a, it's a, 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 an innovation, a new change. And people think it's smart. It has prestige. The king speaks like that. It's carried to other villages by traders, by people who are moving between towns, and from there it spreads out into the countryside, and it's carried very rapidly to the big areas here it's in here it's in the whole of Denmark it's in the whole of Germany a lot of Germany 
it's in various areas here and a little area here around Bergen and you can see that it's spread from from these areas here to Bergen and from Bergen it's spread out a little bit but it hasn't Bergen the Bergen area and these areas haven't joined up yet it's a wave pattern and it's something which doesn't have anything to do with languages this is French this is German this is Danish it's in it's in the whole of the south of Sweden it jumps across languages it jumps across language boundaries <coughs> that's the wave pattern come here what do you want? in the case of Norway do you think it will join because if people look at to Oslo and Oslo they don't if it continues to be a prestige sound people think it's cool then it will spread out mm. if something happens let's say for instance that um, something happens in the south of Europe to make people in Norway dislike the Europeans supposing the French for instance dropped an atomic bomb on, 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 on somewhere here okay and you didn't and then that sort of th then perhaps there would be a, a flashback and people would start thinking that's not a nice pronunciation just depends on prestige just depends on what people feel is cool or not and at the moment it's spreading out is it? yeah at the moment it's spreading out do you know of any French dialect, any French pronunciation left where people have the old r, except in opera perhaps? There used to be a lot in the old days, there used to be a lot a hundred years ago, but they've all, they're all gone now. In the south of France, for instance, I think most people have the, the r, don't they? Don't they? If you think of a southern French accent, yeah. they say r, just the same, but they, did, they, didn't have it, they didn't have it 200 years ago. <coughs> It has been spreading out, and it, it and but we never know. We never. It's like it's like it's like roticism in England. Non-roticism is spreading out in England, but roticism in America is spreading out, and non-roticism is is is, is re retreating. Yeah. When you say it jumped across languages, do you mean it just started here? It started here at the same time, or? No, it takes, it takes, it spreads slowly, it spreads slowly, but for some reason, uh, after it had started spreading into towns in, in, in France, for some reason, the Germans started taking it up. Now, why did that happen? I suppose you could say that it was, a, that perhaps, perhaps it's a virus, perhaps it's just a virus which travels about, you know, it's, it's, it's a... A benign virus, but I mean, that's not likely, is it? Don't think that's very likely. What is more likely is that French, that, that the educated German speakers who could speak French, began to copy it because it sounded good. And that's why it spread into German. Something like that. It's usually, I think, a question of prestige, a question of copying people because it sounds better. Or as you said, because they were trading. Yeah, it starts with trading first. You know, people here would be spelling. I mean. Paris is a fantastic centre. It, it's, it's, it's a cultural centre, was much more than it is today, a cultural centre of the whole of Europe, way right out into Moscow and so on, it's a cultural centre. And what people are doing in Paris. I mean, we know that in the 13th century, we know that the, in the graves which, are being dug, which have been dug up in, 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 uh, in Greenland, in Heriotsnes, in the south of Greenland, uh, graves of of um, of um, Vikings buried in the south of Greenland. We know that their clothes were the highest fashion in Paris about twenty years before that. So people were following fashion, clothes, how to build houses, what sort of wine to drink, what sort of pots and pans to use and language is also a question so much of fashion they spread out from areas of influence there's a name for this we sometimes call it the Sprachbund the German word Plurbünde, Sprachbünde. it means um, a, a binding of certain things which happen throughout many languages 
a, 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 a linguistic variable which spreads out over dialects and over languages. So that is also happening, not only trees, but that as well. Okay? <coughs> And if we go back into the old history of Indo-European, which instead of instead you can also say instead of using these these tree diagrams, you can also say that there are things happening in Germanic, which also happen in the Baltic areas, which also happen in the Slavic areas. What is that? Number four. The northern languages have a dative plural case ending in m, which we have Frau Heston nm, Frau Hestum, Elunde nm. We have it in Icelandic. It's also there in it's also there in uh, in Russian. Om. Two entirely different types of languages have that particular case function. Okay, let's look at. Italic here and Greek. What have they got? They've got number five. Indo Hellenic dialects have voiceless sounds for the Indo European voiced as. Can you read it? Aspirates. Aspirates. For, for, for voice aspirates. That's right. Voiced aspirates. I can't think of any examples here. But that is something which is happening between two entirely different languages. Celtic and Italic have something that would probably be. B, a B type uh, plural, wouldn't it? In uh, have a passive form of the verb ending in R. Yes, they also have a B type, uh, um, a B type um, dative plural. Navibus and and uh, and something like that. If. In Celtic and so on. So that there are also throughout the whole of the Indo-European area, we've got these things spreading out, and uh, and uh, it's a question as to whether we can explain all the changes by waves, or whether we can explain them by trees. And it looks as if we could we use both systems to explain the changes. Okay. Now, why did I've gone on for a long time, haven't I? Um. I tell you what, we'll, we'll, we'll stop here briefly. I'll go, when we finish, I'll go briefly through these first two chapters and see how these people deal with what I've been talking about. And then we'll move into, into our text. So let's have a quick break here. We need to get feedback from you and know what is working well on the web and what is not working. Please don't hesitate if something's not working to send me an email and say, look, so-and-so is not working, because I don't, I don't know whether it, it is or not. Um, because one of the unfortunate things is that uh, when I open my web pages, I go th it's my own web page, and I've always got contact from it. I have to go to somebody else's computer to see whether they can open it up or not. I sometimes do it with my wife's computer, but it doesn't always work. From my computer, I can't open the sound file. Uh, anybody else couldn't open the sound file? Some other people were telling me they couldn't open the sound file. Somebody told me they couldn't open the sound file. Maybe it's just this. Have you got a, a Mac or what? No. One, one thing you can do while I'm recording, now this is one thing you should remember, is that if you can't open the sound file, Wait, it's always outside. that it's works not here. Far. If you can't open it, then try right-clicking and saying save target as save target as and then you get that and you can put it on your desktop and say save and then you've got it on your desktop no, save tar that's target I'm not sure that's right let's see whether we can see this now then you've got that on your desktop and everything freezes and nothing ever happens anymore. <laughs> Why, how do I get out of this, uh, does anyone know how I get out of this whole skin? Um, I fell hmm? 
Fn F11. F11. But F11 turns emission on and off. In order to turn emission on, <laughs> I have. But it should be then on the on the on the uh, uh, it should be on the desktop. Then. Here we go, it's there, and then you can open it at your own speed and your own time. Okay. We'll come back to that in a minute. Because look, let's have a look at let's look at our textbook. I suppose if you look at the first chapter of the roots of English, this is a rundown of what you will have learned anyway in uh, history of the English language, or maybe you're doing it this term in the history of the English language, um, and it's not important as far as I'm concerned here. Read it through. It's good reading. It's nice reading, but it's not important. What will be important in the history of the English language is one or two changes that I have that we have made uh, that has happened in English. One or two changes like the vowel shift and so on, which we'll have to go back and look at. But don't worry too much then at the moment of the first chapter. Uh, chapter 2, the spread of English, is really something which, it's only a very short chapter, it's something which we will deal with at the end of the, um, the, end of the first part of the course. I'll be dealing with that after the, the midterm break, the spread of English into other parts. So we won't think too much about that now. Three is variation in English, and really what is, it's a long chapter, and a lot of it is what I have been talking about up to now. Okay, I'd like you to read that chapter fairly closely. Let's just look. Uh, have you got the book with you? Those of you who got the book with you, um, open it. Those of you who haven't, kick yourselves and say, I promise yourselves never not to take the book with you again. And uh, can you look over somebody's shoulder? All right. Um, okay, uh, if you look at uh, if you look at page eleven in variation of English, some basic concepts: language, dialect, and accent. That's what I've been talking about. But check these terms that they use that he uses here. He uses the terms. Uh, he says, for instance, that the difference between language and dialect is not clear-cut. It's often, suggest often suggested that languages are autonomous. Okay, autonomous, that's to say that they have their uh, own... They decide things for themselves, if you like. They are, they are um, they're independent, whereas dialects are heteronymous that's to say that they are uh, are, are uh, different from a language they are always seen in uh, as a, in respect to another language um, I don't as you can tell from what I said at the beginning of this lesson today I don't really like this it's not really quite the same I linguistically Linguistically, there's no such thing as a language. Linguistically, there are only dialects. But with every group of dialects, there is one. Today, not in the past, but today, with every group of dialects, you've got one dialect, one accent, which is dominant. And this is something which uh, um, he points out here. You can make a distinction, then, in any group of dialects, which we might call a language, between here on page 12, standard and non-standard dialects. Okay, standard and non-standard, and it's most important to use the term non-standard rather than an older term which was sometimes used, substandard. Which, which implies that this dialect, this substandard dialect, is somehow lower and poorer than the standard dialect. 
keep away from this term, although you will hear people who are not linguistically minded using it a lot. They'll say that, 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 that uh, the Cornish dialect, for instance, is a substandard dialect of English, but it's a non-standard dialect English. What has happened is that, the, that, the, that, the gen that standard English and RP has become standardized. And if you go on reading here, uh, he will explain, they explain what happens when a language becomes standard, when a dialect becomes standardized, how it goes through the process of standardization. One of the things that's happening, we're still on page 12, the middle of page 12, Dialects are also said to be used only in certain domains. Now, before we, I look at that, can I explain that Melkers and Shaw sometimes use the word dialects in the, in the way that I'm using them now, a sort of linguistic way. Sometimes they, they seem to use them like the people of England use them. Now, a, an ordinary English person, even an educated English person, will talk about English on the one hand, correct English on the one hand, and the dialects on the other. As if English was not a dialect. They talk about two types of English then, correct English and the dialects. And sometimes Mercius does this. Okay. Uh, but instead of talking like this, I think we, just should, we should always talk about the standard dialect and the many non-standard dialects. That's the big difference there. The standard dialect and the many non-standard dialects. I don't know if that's going to come out on the, on the screen. Next week I'm going to have a so-called snertisgjau, a touch screen, so I can write on the screen, which will be a little bit better. Um, so here, when, when, uh, when, in the middle of, just above the middle of page 12, dialects are also said to be used only in certain domains, a very important word, domain, which is really, if you like, an area of thought, a sphere of thought, a domain would be, for instance, um, agriculture. What, di what, what words are used in, when we're talking about agriculture and farming? Or the medical sciences would be another domain. Or you could say the, the speech of people at home. So you're talking about some sort of jar jargon? Jargons are certain types of domains. But I mean, the domain would also cover the speech of people at home, parents and children in the family, which is not a jargon at all, but it's just the domain of indoors, if you like. Different settings, if you like. Jargons are definitely certain, certain ones. Um, and the point that is often made is that the, the languages, or better, the standard languages, have huge domains. <coughs> All medical English is within standard language, all sports English in standard language, all, all the, these big domains. Whereas the, um, the, um, the dialects may not have these domains. If you, if you for instance, speak a dialect from, uh, from, uh, from Zamerzat, if you're talking like Zamerzat all the time, and you're talking to your friends in Zamerzat, you may be a doctor, but as soon as you start talking about medical English, then you'll start talking about medical English and you'll have to go into standard English, maybe not with a standard English dialect, uh, accent, but you'll have to use standard English in order to talk about your profession. The little dialects don't have this elaboration, elaboration of domains. So that this is what's happened to standard, standard dialects the standard dialects have been elaborated because they are used in schools, they're used in professional life, whereas the, whereas the, the, the home, the geographical dialects, don't have this elaboration. Then he goes and talks about the types of variation which we have talked quite a bit about. But why hasn't, haven't the dialects actually just 
Well, because you, because very few people talk, ha, need to talk about medical things or law. Okay? And another thing is, this is a big problem. If you want to talk in your own dialect about things that you might learn in school, how are you going to write about it? Because the dialects don't have standard writing patterns. All they do is they have, st only standard English has rules of writing. The dialects don't have rules of writing. But, but maybe there are many dialects which are only phonetical. Only spoken? Uh, yeah. Most dialects are only spoken. No, I mean you could write it. Well, you can always write it, yeah, but then in order to do that you have to be a phonetician and you have to have gone to, to university and you had to written your BA on, on phonetics and you can't write your BA in the dialect. Do you see what I mean? Uh, if you're, you can't use that dialect. I can't, if you write a BA and instead of saying, um, uh, shall we say, um, this variation, um, this variation uh, was current in England in the 19th century. You can't say that in southwestern English because you have to say this era of change were uh, very common in the 19th century. And if you write this era of change were very common in the 19th century, you'll get red marks all over it. You have to go into standard English in order to write it, you see. And that's the problem. All our writing is standard English. Everybody learns standard English. All right. But do you write if I if you say uh, uh, that that there that there policeman er beat me up? Okay. Now, how am I going to write the word er, which means he? Like that. But you don't because you are brought up in schools which tell you that this really should be written like that. You could do, but there's no standardization. And your friend might do it differently, oh, you yeah, see. Yeah, yeah. That's the point. Okay. There's no, there's no, you can't go to any dictionary and say, how do you spell this word? Uh -huh. uh, some dialects are beginning to do that. For instance, Scottish is beginning to do it. But there's a lot of, uh, a lot of um, uh, disagreement as to how things should be spelt. If you look at the Scottish, uh, I'll bring you along some when we start talking about Scottish. The Scottish... New Testament, for instance, written in, done into Scottish, into really good Scottish. Um, one of the things that happens is that the different Gospels are written in different dialects of Scottish. Because they were originally in different dialects in the Hebrew and the Greek. They were in different dialects. They're written in different, different dialects of Scottish. There's no one dialect of Scottish. That stand, and, and most educated Scotsmen will write standard English. But they'll speak it with a good Scottish accent, but it'll be standard English. Okay. If you, if you speak English with a Scottish accent, say, you can see, what did you call it? What do you call it? In England, this sort of thing. What do you call it? Now you're speaking standard English. But if you're in Aberdeen and you're speaking Aberdonian, you'll say, Fitchy cat. Oh, sir, Fitchy cat. It doesn't sound like English at all, does it? So you see, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, um, <laughs> there's a big change of, uh, so yeah. Is that basically the sense of what's it called? Fit, fit. Fat, fat, you doing? What are you doing? It's what? Yeah. It's wh has changed to f. You has changed to ye, and call it has changed to cart. Fat your cart. Okay. I'll, sh I'll be playing with you, playing to you some really good Scottish dialects, and we'll see the real difference of it. Okay, it's a very big difference indeed. And it's not, and everybody thinks it's some sort of an abomination, a change. It's not. It goes, fetch your cart, goes back 
to the original Anglo-Saxon, just like what you call it goes back to the original Anglo-Saxon, two different dialects of the original Anglo-Saxon. It's always been different. I do get off my track, don't I, a lot? Okay. Um, what I wanted to point out to you here is, what I want you to read is, yes, is on page 18, the standard, the 24 standard lexical sets. Melchers and Shaw follow Wells here. And I want you to know the standard, the, the standard lexical sets, that's to say, the sets that we all remember from, from phonetics, kit, dress, trap, lot, strut, foot, and all those. Those are the standard lexical sets. Okay. And on the next page, or two pages later, three pages later, four pages later, five pages later, six pages, seven pages, eight pages, nine pages later, where? <laughs> I've lost it. They give you, he gives you, these two writers give you the standard lexical sets with their pronunciation in various places in, oh yes, it must be in the, it must be in the next chapter, which is the inner circle, chapter four, the inner circle is what we're going to begin to talk about now, the inner circle being Britain. And there you get uh, table with the standard lexical sets that's on page 48 the standard lexical sets again the standard lexical sets written down here and the different vowel pronunciations in different parts of the country what page? this is on page 48 but this is what we're going to do for the next three four weeks working out the differences in in England so you see we've got a lot of of, of, of reading in 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 uh, in um, on this chapter on variation. I'd like you to go through it. Some of it I've already talked about. Some of it I really won't mention until we start talking about uh, foreign types of English. That's to say, English overseas. Uh, well, he talks about typology on page 17. The, three d the four different types. Um... South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, General American, Canada, and so on. We won't really be de dealing with that until we get to it after, after the break. I'm rushing. I really want to start this. So you downloaded... You downloaded um, this file, I hope, and you underlined what was not RP as soon as you heard anything that was not RP. Before we play it, who's going to give me the first thing they noticed? Somebody give me the first thing they noticed. Okay, you underlined outside. Yeah. And you and you said that you had some sort of a, a word between them. Yeah. I it felt like that. Okay. Let's yeah. underline outside. Um. The did anybody have anything before that? We'll come back to your word in between. You mean in the order? No, in this in this text. That's right, that's what you heard as well, was it, uh, 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 Asgood? This is perhaps the first thing that really strikes you. Did, it, did you hear that? Let's listen to it, see if we can, we can hear it. She says, we was always at, at, well, of course, was, we dealt with that. She doesn't say we were, she says we was. That's typical London. We was, we was, okay.
We was always outside, not very far. Let's take it again. We was always outside, not very far. Okay, let's listen to that side. That's lovely, isn't it? That's side and side. Okay, this is typical London. And if you want to find out, if you want to know more about what's happening here, then go into the variations, my variations page, and look at vowel, look at diphthong shift. That's something we have to... we have to look at. Where are we, index? Come on. Oh, for God's sake. Variables. Go into the variables. Diphthong shifts. Look at diphthong shifts. Uh, it's not complete yet. Open this up, and you'll find uh, you'll find uh, uh, what I say about diphthong shifts. And you have to read about diphthong shifts very much more closely in the book when we get through to it. It's something which is happening in the southern dialects of English, Cockney, and Estuary English, the English of the wider London area. Uh, but it's not happening in mainstream RP. I don't do it. I say side and not side, okay. It reaches north to Birmingham, and it also is very common in the southern hemisphere, Australia, New Zealand, and that is why you felt that this joke was Australian. What is the difference between a buffalo and a bison? Has anybody got it yet? No. Okay. You can't wash your hands in a bison. Okay, you can't wash your hands in a... No, you can wash... No, you can't wash your hands in a buffalo. <laughs> you can wash your hands in a basin. A basin is what you wash your hands in. Okay. And the point is that somebody is using the using diphthong shift when they talk about a bison, and it sounds like a basin. So what would that person say if they meant a bison, if they meant this one? Not a buffalo, but a, a boison. See what's happening? Um, see what's happening here? I is changing to oi. Oi is changing to we. A is changing to I. And in fact, E is changing to it's not getting right down to A, it's sort of E. It's a sort of E, it's a sort of oh, something like this, but not quite like this. Okay. Fleece, fleece, fleece. Instead of saying paint, Londoners say pint. Instead of saying pint, Londoners say point. And instead of saying point, Londoners say point. It's all moving round one. It's diphthong shift. And this is exactly what's happening. And it happens at the other side with O and O, although it's a bit complicated to look at what's happening there. So diphthong shift is the big pointer, pointer, not the pointer, but the pointer. It's the big pointer to southern English pronunciation. And it's also, uh, it's also very... Uh, Australian, the Australians say Australian, they don't say Aus.
They don't say Australian, they say Australian. Okay. Um, met an Australian girl this summer, friend of friend of ours who came over, and I still don't know whether her name was Kylie or Kaylee. I still don't know. And I asked her several times. Because she called herself Kylie. Kylie. So I said, Oh, you mean like Kylie Minogue? And that's Coily. Hang on. Where are you? Uh, are you. But you call yourself Kylie? Yes, my name is Kylie. Okay. She had another sister, or, or she could have had another sister, whose name was Kite. Not Kate, but Kite. They have this big diphthong shift, and it sometimes causes problems. Okay. So that's what's happening in the south of England. It's a very, very clear diphthong shift. And I want to sh I'll be showing you later that one other thing that's happening there is that this is a continuation of the shift which changes, which changes E in English, E to I. You remember this from the the old vowel shifts, the old great vowel shifts. Why is it in English that this word is pronounced bit, but this word is not pronounced bite? It's pronounced bite. Why? What queer thing is happening there? You put an, an e on the end of it, you don't pronounce it, and it changes this to i. What is happening there? Why on earth do we do that? And the answer is that if you go back 600 years, this was pronounced beat and this was pronounced beat. Beat and beat. And you probably have an N on the end of it, to bite, to beat. <coughs> and E has changed into E and A and A and A and A and I and I down to modern my pronunciation and in some places it's going on and changing to I and I and I and I and OI it's just a big change which is continuing and it's gone further in the south of England than it has in my dialect it's gone much further in the south of England than it has in Scottish where they still say beat okay no they don't but, but why, why is it because of the E then what happens is what happens is that you get the word bit bit which means a bite and you get the verb to beaten and then this drops off and you get to beat and then this starts being longer and that drops off so instead of saying to beat you say to beat to beat and then uh, drops off and you just get to beat and then what happens is you've got a short bit here and a long bit here and the long bit starts moving into bit and bait and bite and bite. Because there is no space in the short e to move. This is long disappeared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But why, why isn't it the, the, the short one that changes? Why does the short one change not the long one? No, yeah. <laughs> Don't ask me. Nobody knows. Maybe it's because there is no space. Mm. Uh, probably because the long the long vowel when it becomes longer beat then it's got more time to start moving around hasn't it mm. and this e changing into i is now happening with the e which came up to fill its place the e which is now we now write as e because that moved up okay i had to put this on the board for you later this is this is the vowel shift that moved up and you get that changing now. So modern English E, which is now written not like this, but like this. C. It used to be C, and it's moved up to C. Now that's doing exactly the same thing, and it's changing to C and C and C, and come back in another 400 years' time, and it will be pronounced Sai. I expect, if things go on this way. 
all changing. All the, the, the vowels are in their little vowel chart and they're all moving around all the time like, like tea leaves in a, in, in, in a bottle of tea leaves. They're all moving around all the time, pushing each other out of the way and changing. But is there any reason why it's not going this, in this direction and not, not the other? Right, so that's, uh, that is the, the big question. Why does it go in that direction and not the other? Uh, and um, in some parts of the world it is going in the other direction you take for instance what's happening in between you take for instance what's happening between uh, here is London and here and here is New York you take the sound or here in London thought okay and it's moving in this direction it's going up to ooh I thought so thought so. In New York it's moving in this direction and even up here a thought so. And they're moving apart at a fantastic rate. I uh, Londoners are saying uh, 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 I bought a ticket I bought a ticket for, for, the, for the show I bought a ticket. I bought a ticket in America. And it's become even more further some people in some parts of America, particularly upstate New York, in places like B Buffalo, it's becoming bad. <coughs> ah. Whereas ah is getting out of the way. You see, it's getting in the way of ah, and in new upstate New York, ah is turning into air. Eh. That's bad, man. That's a very bad thing to say. And the whole thing is always moving around in different directions. Usually, a movement. Uh, seems to go in, in one dialect it goes in the same direction because otherwise sounds would fall together and you'd not, you know uh, but that does also happen sounds merge and fall together and problems arise and the language starts finding new ways you know, saying two words exactly the same and if that's a problem we have, a, we have the problem in English between these two words they used to be pronounced differently, riad and red, and they fell, fell together. It didn't cause much of a problem, actually, because the two words are so different that you're not going to mix them up. And usually, they're not, that doesn't make a problem. But occasionally, it makes, it makes a, it, it's a problem, and language finds another way out of it, makes a new word or something. So sometimes vowels are coming together, sometimes they're, falling, they're, 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 they're splitting into two, as we'll look at very soon now, next week. Let's quickly, we've got two minutes left. I want to, I've got, I've got um, hundreds of things to do in these last two minutes. We was all wise. We was all wise. Have you noticed that the same thing is happening with ways as is happening with side? Side is turning into side and ways is turning into wise. We was all wise. Listen to the L in all. It's dropping out. It's not all ways. It's all, all. It's becoming a, 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 it's becoming a, a W, and it's called L. Vocalization. If you look up that variable, you'll find this is occurring in many parts of the south of England. Milk is pronounced milk. Well is pronounced well. Okay. We was always outside, and out, out, is ow, is more of a sort of ah sound. At, at, outside. And in real, real London, it will become at, outside. Get out, get out my ass. Get out of my house. Get out my ass. Okay. What kind of London is this? It's not Cockney, it's more general London. Uh, and it's the, it's the big, many people are saying it is the beginning of the new standard English. It seems to be, people are speaking like this much more and more and more and more. She doesn't, for instance, drop her H's. She says, huh, where they are there. She says, um, uh, oh, I can't find it, but she would say, uh, inside the house. She says the has. She doesn't say inside the ass. Inside the has. She doesn't drop her H's, where in London they do drop her H's. It's estuary English. It's the area of the greater London, of the Thames, of the Thames Valley. 
and you'll hear it more and more if you tune into our p into, into BBC you'll hear that, that uh, more and more people are using estuary English and it's becoming quite a standard some people are saying it's taking it's having an effect on RP as well it's having a bit of an effect on RP one of the things that she says which you may find a bit surprising is that the word think listen to this is pronounced think I think so think so. Very typical London. What happens is that uh, let's have it in let's have th, th changes to th and what do you think th would change to then? To v. Mother father Yeah, you can sometimes see it when they, when you're trying to write down a London dialect. People might say, "This is me mother," like that. Me mother, me brother. You can see that. And there's this big joke, this old joke, which I think one of the first jokes I ever laughed at when I was three years old or something. Uh, guy comes out of prison, prisoner comes out of prison after 20 years in prison and he runs down the road shouting, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free, and somebody says, little boy says, so what, I'm four. <laughs> okay, I thought it was very funny when I was four years old. One, two, three, four, and they say one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. But three and four have gone through that change before. Quatuor quinque in Latin. Quatre, and it used to be cinq, but now it's cinq, okay? K and K. It should be... It should be... F it should be... The two words have dropped together, and I can't know what it is now. The, the, the real English should be, if it, if, it had, if it hadn't made this change, it should be one, two, three, four, five. Yes. It's done, it happened before. It's happened in the past, and everybody thinks it's okay now. It's happening again now, three and four, and maybe that will become the language of the, of the present, I don't, of, of, of the future. They say what? They, instead of that? Oh, yeah, because they can't, because, fr yeah, yeah b that's right. People can't say th in French, not used to saying th. And I have fr heard French people say free. Yeah, three of them, instead of three of them. Yeah, yeah. She does it. We'll have to spend more time on her later. I don't want to sp spend too much time on it. What we will do later on in, in, in this, this term is to find, listen to very short parts of the we finished haven't we very very short parts of the um, short texts where something is happening yeah okay let's finish there let's finish there be good to yourselves read through the first chapters of Merkers and 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 and, and sure